Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be here at Web Summit. This is my first uh, Web Summit experience. Outstanding event. So to uh, understand a little bit about what we do at Unity and why we do it, you can see it uh, symbolized behind me here. This symbol depicts the cosmic perspective that is the view of Earth from space. Because it is from this perspective that we can really understand and appreciate the oneness and unity of our pale blue dot and hopefully feel a little more inspired to take care and improve the ecosystem that we live on. But also, uh, when I personally look at the view of Earth from space, I feel a little inspired to contribute to our civilization through technology. And I'm sure this is probably shared by, by many people at this event for obvious reasons. What it looks like in practice is a little electric car from Sweden. It doesn't look a whole lot like all the other cars out there, and nor should it. Obviously, electric car technology is fundamentally different to combustion engine technology. We don't have heat, friction, vibration. We don't have all of the same old components and so forth. So of course, this machine could be a whole lot different if we have an opportunity to completely rethink it from the ground up. So we're not designing for old car culture values or um, perhaps our context in the company, our competitive advantage or our economies of scale or our, our belief systems, our assumptions. If we can completely start again and design for the usage patterns of modern people and modern technology, it stands to reason that it might look a little different. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this uh, vehicle today. There's a lot of interesting features to it, as you could expect, but I'm going to just demonstrate one of them. But the basics are, it's a very lightweight machine that we can manufacture in a very scalable manner with a very low carbon imprint so that we can have a margin so we don't have to design the vehicle to break down and, and things like that. I want to start with a show of hands, if you're ready. Who here in this audience thinks that we will keep using this medieval invention for all of human history? Raise your hand. Ten, fifteen people think we will use the steering wheel for the rest of human history. And the rest probably agree with me. At some point, we're going to change to something different. Now, based on the concepts that I've seen, the automotive industry would have you believe that we are going to go from this steering wheel to absolutely no steering wheel at all, which really completely neglects the fact that humans like to stay in control. They want to stay in control, and they absolutely love the joy of driving. Going from a steering wheel to a fold-away steering wheel or no steering wheel is probably the equivalent of going from the Nokia 3110 rubber button phone to Siri with absolutely nothing in between. Or perhaps the, the round dial input phone to Siri. The question then is if we all think perhaps one day it will change, I, I'm sure some of you agree there has to be something in between the rubber buttons and Siri. So the question is, when will it change? When will it change to something different? It is my opinion and the opinion of our company that when certain criteria are met, then we will change. The first criteria, the technology must be mature enough. So we're not talking about a crazy invention or crazy R&D. We need the technology to be mature enough, industrialized, ready for mass consumption, legally compliant. And everything I show you today is made of components that are 
already industrialized and are perfectly legal, including in our vehicle, which will be for sale soon when we launch it at the end of this year. And people will be able to order this. No additional license needed, nothing like that. If many of you are from the automotive industry, you're probably designing for the M1 vehicle category. This is a category below the L7 E class, which I think is much more suited to electric cars. So the technology needs to be mature enough, and there has to be a design good enough to attract people to something different, right? The design has to be attractive enough to change our behavior. What we are is not a car company, and we could never be that. We are a technology company by 50% and 50% a behavior change company. So the design has to be good enough. Now, once upon a time, we used to design things in a secret room in Cupertino. But because of those things that were designed back then, Luckily, now we get to connect with the whole world. We can involve thousands of stakeholders and thousands of people to make sure we de-risk that design a little bit. I have a, a metric that I like to use. Not a metric. You could call it a, a scale, an economic model. It's called the diminishing marginal return of weirdness. If you have weirdness on one scale and satisfaction on the other scale, the weirder and weirder it gets, the more exciting it gets for the first mover. But if you go too far over, there's a diminishing return. If it's too weird, people don't want it. So we have to design somewhere in that sweet spot that appeals to first movers, but also appeals to a completely different animal called the digital native. The digital natives, of course, are very different to any other generation before because historically, culture was always locally reinforced, right? That's why once upon a time we were okay with cannibalism and things like that. But now culture is globally reinforced. People have a little open mind and they're looking for completely different technology. The design must be good enough. And of course, finally, the people must be ready. And that's a tricky one. It's events like this, in fact, that make me feel like perhaps some people are ready, but it remains to be seen. What's really important in this design process is that we start on the user side, not on the car side. Now, I'm, I'm sure many of you are from the auto industry. Perhaps even some are designers. You might have heard the phrase human-centric design design for the user first. But in fact, what you're doing, design for the human first, but please design for the mechanical properties of the machine, the mechanical boundaries of the machine. Design for that human, but make sure there's a steering wheel, steering, steering column, pedals, a glass window to your left. Or right, depending on where you're from. With a startup, it is a unique freedom. We have many disadvantages, but some advantages. And one of the key advantages is the ability to start fresh, close to the customer. Of course, we have design parameters. Now, this process took many years. It started as, a, as an open innovation project, a research project at a big Swedish engineering uh, university. I was directing a, a research center there. And I said to the guys, if we end up back at the steering wheel, it is totally OK. But we must not start at the steering wheel, right? Because humans are very path-dependent creatures. We evolved to be path-dependent because we evolved to stay on the same path so that we don't get eaten by a lion. Although, unfortunately, now over time, we stay path-dependent and it's very difficult to get off that path, even if the technologies we use today are killing us. So once upon a time, path dependency kept us alive, and now part of it kills us. Of course, I'm referring, referring to some combustion engine technologies, certainly not the steering wheel. It must be ergonomic. There must be an improvement in safety. We must be an improvement in control. It must be flexible because that's the kind of technology we're used to. 
and it must be fun to drive. So the result of all of this research is something I'll show you now. We start with the effortless range of motion. This is not always the effortless range of motion, but when we start afresh with the human, we can start to define what that is. What you see behind me here is a parallel joystick steering method. The steering system pivots in the center of your knuckle and it pivots in the center of your wrist so that every place that you direct that vehicle is a conscious and direct action. Of course, we know the opposite of accident is deliberate. So we need every motion of the vehicle to be deliberate. It's why we don't have a head-on collision with a bicycle very much, because we're very connected into what we're doing and where we're going, as opposed to what is really an abstract means of driving a car. What you see here is the two joysticks. They always remain in parallel so that you can re remove one hand and still be going around the corner. You have a lot more control than a foot and a steering wheel, and we can make more deliberate movements. Now, you'll notice there's no buttons and levers on here. Does anybody here think it's a little weird that when we want to turn right, we still pull a lever? Now, I don't know why that is. I have some theories. I can tell you it's not regulatory reasons, certainly not in our class. We still pull a lever. Granted, once upon a time, there was a flag that popped up, but it's been an electronic signal for a long time. The way in which we control different functions of the car can be seen at the top of the handle on two screens similar to this one here controlling the lights, controlling everything else. Why don't we take a look at a representation of what it looks like in the flesh. Now, what I'm showing you here is not the production version by any means. It is a representation for the purpose of this speech. We do have to keep... Yeah, clap, that's good. <laughs> Oh, thanks. That was a charity clap. <laughs> it's a representation of what you'll see in the car that we unveil on December 7th of this year. So what you can see here is the two joysticks. Really fluid movement. To go left and right, forward and back. There's no big process of buttons and so forth. So how do I turn right? This is not the generation that pulls a lever this is a generation that swipes right. You swipe right, you swipe left, turn the lights on and off. I can control my music and all of that kind of stuff with this piece here. The handles have haptic feedback in there and force feedback so that we can enhance the safety and change things like at a higher speed, you want a, a less turning curve, and at a lower speed, you want a harder turning curve. Perhaps when I turn right and merge into traffic that's oncoming, the haptics can give me a little buzz and the force feedback can let me know, don't drive there because our vehicle has a full sensory system for full autonomy, which is a discussion for perhaps another day. People hold it in all different ma manners. Some like to have it on a trigger like this. Uh, I just like to hold it like that. You'll notice here, a screen. In our vehicle, we have no mirrors. So right in front of your eyes, we just use cameras. So this vehicle has no blind spot. I feel a blind spot is a fairly trivial thing to solve, and it's not something we need to continue with, just like a lever or a button. So I have my rear view cameras here, and all the other information I need is right here in front of me as I need it. And there's really nothing else. If I look out on the road, we also do have a big heads-up display, 100 liters of optics, again, another discussion. But that means I don't have to take my eyes off the road to conduct many of the normal tasks, like turning the music on or off or doing anything like that. Because of the haptics in these screens, I can drag my finger down and physically feel a button there, 
just like some people like the feel of an air conditioning button or something like that, you can also feel it on this screen here. But you can keep your eyes out on the road and have full control. Increase the safety and increase your awareness because we think the first pillar of safety in automotive is awareness. And when I look down here, it lights up a little. When I look out there, it dims a little because, of course, we track your face, we track your eyes, um, and we don't send any of that to the cloud, just if you're wondering. So that's the basics of the rig. Uh, as said, this is not uh, the production version. It's something we put together for this show. Um, the real production version will demonstrate in a, a couple more weeks on December 7th. Now, as said, what I show you here is not a crazy idea. It's an option in our car. Some people will want to use the normal steering system, which you can also do. Press a button and use this one here. There is a lot of reasons why you might want to try this, safety or control or something like that. But I promise you, the one reason that you would want to try this more than anything is because it is fun to drive. I drive this thing all the time on a real car. And when you got 0 to 80 in 3.5 seconds with that thing there, it is like, it's like instead of wrestling a bunch of horses under the hood, you're piloting a street spaceship. I feel it's a little more up to date with consumer electronics, which is certainly the approach we take with product design in this company, consumer electronics. All of the components here, as said, are industrialized. There's nothing crazy and new ready for mass production, legally compliant in our vehicle, and much more simple to manufacture with a lower carbon footprint. This module here, actually it's probably difficult to manufacture, but the part we have to do is just assemble it to the vehicle, so that part's a lot easier. We don't have a name for it yet. If you've got a name, you can by all means uh, let us know. I'll cover this one back up. So. Let's say hypothetically the design is good enough for some, for some audiences. If it's ready for industrialization, it only begs one more question. Are the people ready? Put your hand up if you're ready. Oh, nice. Oh, that's a great response. That could have gone terribly. <laughs> Are the people ready? Well, as said, uh, you can check us out at a booth over here. Uh, on December 7th, you're more than welcome to join us at our uh, launch ceremony where we'll show a lot more tricks than this. Uh, if you're in the media or journalist, we have a press conference tomorrow at 11.30 and we're going to drop a much bigger bomb than this one. Um, so with that, I am dead on time. Thank you very much for your time.